Attention, please. Go, Timmy. May I have your attention, please? Let's call this college a conference to the order. Maybe once. My name is Tim. I'm going to be helping moderate tonight along with Andy Anderson. And I would just like to welcome all of you tonight to the College of Conferences. Again, I'd like to call order to the college, please. My name is Tim. And again, I'd like to welcome all of you to the college. Just to be over a couple of ground rules here. The first will be, we only have two. One is no personal attacks, and the other one, and the other one is one fool at a time, and that's generally the one with the mic. Now, with that, the format of the college consists of the following. We have a brief announcements period. We will be putting the uh, podium back at the rebuttal period, but uh, Tom has requested to kind of have a more open forum tonight. So with that, all right, we do have a speaker tonight. Author Tom Dressler, the Civic Lab speaks on Chicago, is still not broke, heading into the 2019 elections. Meeting 3493 of the College of Complexes. Chicago is not broke. Funding the city we deserve is a book and a website and a civic engagement enterprise. We want to dig deep and share a number of ideas on saving money and developing new sustainable and just revenue streams for Chicago. This touches everyone in our great city and everyone can participate. Let's give a round. Tom Tressler spoke here before in 2010 on how, the, how he uh, sabotaged the Olympic bid for Chicago. Let's give a big rousing round of applause to Mr. Tom Tressler. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thanks everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, and uh, my name is Tom Tresser. I am a civic educator and public defender. All right, All right. but uh, not in the terms of the law courts as probably you're thinking about, but in terms of the very word public, uh, which means a lot to me and the Tresser family. Uh, it's my uh, belief that uh, Chicago is ground zero for assault on public in America. Can you say parking meters? Yes. Right. So um, I believe that uh, what makes a city great, what makes a country great, has the word public in front of it. So uh, that's what I believe, and that's that's my civic work. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, I was one of the organizers for No Game Chicago back in 2009, and we derailed the Olympic bid. So you know Olympics. You can, you can curse us or thank us. Thank you. Either way, you're welcome. All right. Um, but actually why I'm here tonight is really starts with that work way back when. Because, if you recall, one of the reasons why the Olympics were, pro were prosecuted and were promoted was the narrative from the mayor that Chicago is broke. Remember? We have no money and we have no ideas, apparently for how to get money to make the city prosperous for everybody. In fact, Mayor Daly had a press conference as we were turning up the heat, but we didn't mention this by name. He said, stop throwing darts at this bid because we have nothing up our sleeve. And that was a quote from the mayor. There was nothing up his sleeve uh, to make the city prosperous, to spread the love from beyond the loop into these neighborhoods that had been neglected for so long. So, I got to wonder, what's the back story on this Chicago not being broke? Well, one of the things that happened was we got a hold of all the TIF reports, tax income and finance reports, as part of our battle against the bid. We put together all those TIF reports for 2008, and we discovered $1.7 billion, $1.7 billion in property taxes sitting in those TIF accounts. So once we had that number in hand, we were able to just basically say to the mayor and all his people and all the forums that we were at, I think we were at about 75 public forums uh, during 2009, and sometimes the press would come to us for a reaction, and we would just say, they're lying. They're not broke, we're not close to being broke. There was almost $2 billion of property taxes sitting in accounts right this minute. Let's talk about that. Not putting on a party seven years from now that would cost about 20 billion conservatively. That would bankrupt the city for generations. So they hated us for that. But that led me to the TIF Illumination Project and the creation of the Civic Lab. So the Civic Lab is a space for civic innovation, investigation, and education, and activation. 
Uh, and that's, what's, uh, that's what I do. I run the Civic Lab. So in 2013, we started to look at tax increment financing districts, and we used data mining, reporting, uh, old school organizing, and uh, graphics to try to tell the story to the neighbors across the city of what is a TIF and why should you care. Sounds pretty gnarly, sounds pretty in the weeds, but look, it's your property taxes, and there's nothing more basic than that. And as I recall, back in the day, we fought a, a revolution, didn't we? When they were messing with our taxes. We didn't like what they were doing, so we kicked the British out, and we said, no taxation without representation. So it's actually pretty fundamental. Uh, and so what we discovered is that this TIF business is a giant scam, uh, and it's underreported, or hardly reported. And we started our TIF and Malouche project in 2013 at a theater, uh, the Chopin Theater, over there on the division with about 230 people, and we broke it down. This is what a TIF is, this is how it works, this is how much money it's taking from this ward, and a bunch of other stuff. And we asked the people if, if, if they found that interesting, go home and bring us to your community, and we'll do the same. Same, same mantra, here's what a TIF is, here's the details for your ward, how much money's coming from the ward, and who got paid. Brothers and sisters, that's 73 meetings ago. It hasn't stopped for, um, let me see, five years. It hasn't stopped. We're going to have another one in two weeks for the 20th Ward. That will be meeting 73. The media refuses to cover those meetings. They refuse to write about it. But 6,000 people have come to those meetings because they want to know where their property tax is. Now, the reason why I mentioned it is because the number one question that comes up at each of these meetings, and I'm talking about 72, is how can Chicago be broke? Because you're telling us, Tom, that hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, are being showered on, de on developers and the undeserving rich of our property taxes while they close my school, or they cut my school, or there's no library in my school, or my park sucks. It's, you know, or you know, the, the, the no coaches in my, you know, the, all these stories. Or I'm waiting 45 minutes for a bus to get to work. Or I have to take three, you know, you're hearing these stories over and over again. It doesn't square um, with what I'm telling them. So I'm telling them that there's money lying around that's being used and abused, and they're, looking, they're living with civic uh, poverty. So that was a good question. That led to the writing of the book, Chicago is not broke, funding the city we deserve. Now, it's got um, a bunch of pieces to it. Um, and I should just say, before I, I tell you what's in the book, I want to share with you how I approach city, civic budgets. And uh, you guys have been around the, the, the civic bend a couple of times, so this may not be news to you, but this is what I share with my audiences all over the city. I encourage them to think about budgets like they look at their own homes. And I, I often will take someone from the audience and ask them, you know, are you planning something with your house? Are you doing an addition to your house? Are you, do you have a child going to college? Uh, are you try, going to take a vacation? I'm trying to tease from the audience some plan uh, where somebody is thinking big about their future and it involves money. And there's always somebody who's willing to share. And what we're trying to do by lifting up this story is telling people, look, as you're making plans for your future, whether it's refinancing your home, you're building a porch, you're sending a kid to school, you're paying down your car, um, paying down your home, you are using your finances to make something come true for you in your vision of the future, right? So this makes sense for people. They go, yeah, sure, I understand that. Uh, so that means you're making a budget you're doing less, perhaps, you know, you're saving money, so instead of going out for dinner or buying a movie or getting that extra bottle of wine that you like, you put that money aside for the thing that you're trying to plan for. So there's a little bit of sacrifice. There's a little bit of priority setting. There's a little bit of value setting. So you're surfacing your values when you're making your city budget or your, or your personal budget. You're saying, this is how I want to live, this is, how, this is my future, and I'm putting my money behind it, and I'm planning, and uh, I'm going about my business to make it happen. And so people going, yeah, okay, I understand that. That, that makes sense. That's how I kind of, you know, try to move through life. 
with the finances that I have. And I say, well then, you're expressing your values in this way. And so what we say then is a budget is a moral document. And it takes it a little bit out of the realm of the economic guys and the cold, you know, money crunchers, and it puts it a little bit back into your home to think about this. But the city's budget is a moral document. And it reflects our collective vision, if you will, our collective future. Where are we going as a city? Um, and I ask you tonight, uh, and I'm going to ask you very specifically in a few minutes, does it reflect your values? Does it reflect your vision for the city and your communities? Okay? And so, for a budget like what we're going to be discussing here, it's a moral document, first of all. But it's also more, it's a political document. And it describes winners and losers. It describes who's up and who's down. Who's in with the mayor and his people, and who is out. And when I ask the neighbors, and again, this, this meeting about the book is meeting number 63. 63 meetings on the book. I ask, do you feel your community is in? Do you feel your community... Just a whole little about a fist away from your mouth. Do you feel that your community is, is uh, winning? is prospering, and the answer is always no. So uh, um, the budget then is a scorecard. The budget will tell you who is winning and who's losing when you look at it. Remember the movie, uh, All the President's Men? Yes. <laughs> when you know the guy in the shadows was telling the reporter how to go about his business, and he said, follow the money. <laughs> and he just disappeared into the shadows, you know, and <laughs> Robert Weber's going, what do you mean? What do you and so they broke the story by following the money. And that's part of how I approach this work. Regardless of what the politicians say to you, what's important, their mouths are moving, right? You know, they're talking, they're saying something. Don't believe it. Look at the money. Look who's getting the money, and you, and you that will tell, tell you the, the answer to the question of who's winning and who's losing. All right, so let's get going here. I want to start. By asking the group, bad decisions, bad money decisions made by the city <clears throat> in the last few years. This is this is money spent or parking not spent. Meter. Parking meters. I heard that's the first thing I heard. <laughs> All right. Why don't you like the parking meters? The daily the why did you, why don't you like the parking meters? They can't park. Um, it's, just, it's expanded the time on the parking meters, and uh, the city doesn't get the money. The money. Okay, so there's there's a, there's an idea that the money isn't going to, to us, right? All right. So to 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 sum up the parking meter deal, uh, back in 2008. The city council got a document about this thick. They had three days to look at it, but frankly, most of these aldermen can't read the phone book. But they got a, this kind of deal. And they had three days to do whatever. And um, it passed 45 to 5. And what happened was the city got $1.1 billion in ready cash, which we spent in about 10 minutes. And in return, uh, a, a, a co company, an entity called LAZ Parking, which was a creature of Morgan Stanley, uh, got our meters for 75 years. Unheard of. The laughing stock in civics in, in the world. So when, when people come together in different places to discuss uh, either civic finance or the idea of, of public, the public good, or sometimes what's called the commons, this deal is held up in universal ridicule. Like, how stupid were we to fall for that? Well, Mayor Daly is now working for the law firm that prosecuted the deal, so I guess he's, he's pretty happy with himself. Anyway, Morgan Stanley will make, uh, according to Bloomberg Financial, $10 billion for the one billion they got, gave us. 10 for one. I don't know about you guys, but if you gave me a deal at five for one, you know, I give you one and you give me five, at no risk. Now, why do I say no risk? Well, unless we start doing like the Jetsons do and park in the air, 
you know, with the, with the hover cars, it's a pretty safe bet that we're going to need to park on the ground by the meters. No risk. Okay. If you told me, Tom, if you give me one dollar, I'm going to give you five back within, say, you know, eight or nine years because they will make their money back next year. I'll give you my house. I'll give you my house right now, all right? All right. But it's worse than that because uh, Morgan Stanley now sits at the public policy table every time the common good is discussed. So if you want to talk about reducing air pollution or reducing congestion or other things of this nature, you must pay Morgan Stanley for every meter you take away. You pay them $2 million. So if you wanted to take a meter offline in your community for whatever reason, you've got to come up with either another meter in the same zoned area or pay Morgan Stanley $2 million. They sued us because there was too many handicapped folks uh, with the hangers, you know, which allowed them to, to, to not put money in the meter. And they uh, took us to court and we had to set, set, pay them more money. Okay. We could go on all night about that one. That one really gets my goat. Other bad ideas. Red light cameras. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Uh, pain, uh, okay, so I heard two things. The red light cameras, which is sort of the same thing as here. And uh, police violence. Settlements. Yeah, so we cover that in the book. It's a huge number, and uh, we're going to we're, we're you know we're going to see a, a, a trial unfold now this week with the murder of LeBron McDonald, and people are going to be called to the stand, and we're going to hear all about that, and it's going to get very very ugly in the city. Mark my words, but it's 690 million dollars and rising just in the last 13 years. So we can't seem to stop doing that, but yeah, that's a real bad example of spending city money. Uh, and we're gonna get back to that in just a few minutes. Other examples of people, yeah. The increase in useless mass transit. What is, what is, what does that mean? What is useless mass transit? Well, like for example, what the toll road is doing with their pace bus system, with all these useless extra stops they're putting in. They're hardly ever used. Is that the city or is that the state? Part, part of the state, maybe the city, but I do know somebody's getting a cutback. Okay. Other ideas? Other, other things? Yeah. Skyway. The Skyway. The skyway. Yeah, right. The Skyway was privatized. <laughs> and then I would put that in the same category as the parking meter. Yeah, the way in the back? Um, the Grant Park parking was also privatized. Yeah, the, the Monroe Street garage is also privatized. Uh, So this idea of privatization is, is, is bad, yeah? Uh, speed cameras. So back, up, back up here with the red lights and the speed. Well, speed cameras are good. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're for safety, right? Owning money to the banks. Yeah. Uh, we, we get into bad bank deals. We're going to talk about that. This is a sophisticated crowd, as I would expect, yeah. To, to allow demonstrations on the expressway. Speeding cars. You don't like the demonstrations on the expressway. <laughs> ah, charter schools. That's what I'm looking for. So again, charter schools are, to me, in the camp of privatization and shifting money from public use to private use. Personally, if you you know if you wanted to start a school and charge fifteen thousand dollars a person, I don't care. Just don't use public money for it. You know, if you've, if you've got a great idea and you can get people to pay. So again, I display my bias to you by saying I'm someone who's a public defender. I'm going to come down on the stand of the public every time. Yeah, Charles. I I'm sorry. I I these speed cameras and these red light things. I don't own a car, and I'm a member. I've been a charter member of America Walk. And I know the figures of people that get hit by cars that go through red lights or go any any car over five miles per hour will result in the fatality. And you're telling me my life is anything that precludes my me from getting hit by a car is a bad decision? 
Yeah, yeah I'm saying that. I should get hit by horse. Yeah, I'm speed. saying that it's a uh, it's a scam on you. It's a, it's, it's another a regressive scam? form of revenue. Getting hit by cars. Is a scam. All right. Any other ideas before we get into the main point of the talk? Way in the back. <laughs> Police overtime. <laughs> So we don't like that. Stadium for DePaul University. Oh my goodness! I thought somebody would get into that. <laughs> Let's call it Tiff Tiff Abuse and the DePaul Stadium. Using money to upgrade Navy Pier. Right. Yeah, I know, honey. Right. So that's the uh, that's the the scam that was uh, sort of like a. Um, oh, 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 that was, oh, oh. Careful there, brother. That was the money laundering where uh, fifty-five million dollars was sent from the Metropolitan Pier Authority to the pier, their colleagues at the pier, presumably for the Ferris wheel, we're not sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, permit only signs on side streets. So it's permit signs. <laughs> Zone parking. Zones. Zone parking, yeah. All right. Now, what I'm here to tell you is that none of these things were necessary. Now, usually, uh, I would say you left some things out that I normally see, and usually that somebody says closing of public schools. Would you put that on this list? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, well, that goes with charter schools. The charter schools. Okay, so we amend our list here retroactively and by saying closing public schools. Because that's usually the first thing, you know, uh, you know when, when I'm in a specific community brought there by a community organization, this is something that's still very raw with them, you know, with the, with the groups that I'm usually speaking before. All right. So, am I going to volunteer for me and just put this up and put it on the wall? Like over the Chicago Bears uh, sign? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you going to have a good season this year? I don't know. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alfredo. All right. Alfredo? Now I want to tell you about what's in this book. Chicago's not broke funding in the city we deserve. The book starts with a introduction to the budget by uh, our most civic expert, our former civic expert. Uh, his name is Dr. Ralph Martier. I'd be real quick. I'd like to request order in the college so I can hear him clearly, please. Uh, the, na the name of our author for the opening chapter is Dr. Ralph Dr. Ralph Martier of the Center for Budget and Tax Accountability. So he is someone that is often called upon by the media, by the legislature, by unions to school us and school them about how our budgets work. And I asked Ralph, would he put uh, a special article in there that explains the uh, overview of the budget? And he wrote that for a special. So that's uh, that's what that's what the price of admission by itself. The book is uh, all of twelve dollars, by the way. Fruit, pancakes. And you can see. Oh, that's not good. No, it's, it's uh, we just got to secure it better. All right, hold on. Hold. Let me a brief pause. <laughs> okay, our technology fails us sometimes. All right, so that's the opening of the book. Dr. Martieri uh, explains the complexity of the budget. And there's, al there's already a few things in that first chapter that's going to get your blood pressure going. So have your Zantex handy. Uh, he points out that the, the budgeting process in Chicago is kept complex on purpose. They would rather you not know what we're telling you. The book uh, explains uh, the, uh, how the budget works. And I will just say, in shorthand, because the mayor controls other bodies and appoints the leadership of uh, the Board of Ed, the CTA, the CHA, uh, the Public Building Commission, uh, you know, it goes on and on, that he actually controls uh, Park District. Don't forget the Park District. 
He actually controls a $20 billion annual budget, all in. Because it's uh, 10 billion is about the corporate budget of the city. That's what we're used to thinking. But then when you add up all these other agencies, it's 20 billion dollars. So we explained that to you in that first chapter. All right. Now, in order to uh, get across a lot of information simply, what I've done is divide the book into three big buckets. Okay. And this is how we talk about this stuff around the around the community. And it seems to be working. It seems to be a helpful and useful way to discuss the information that I'd like to impart. So this is how we talk about it. Three large buckets of civic money. The first bucket is money that's been stolen from us, or we shouldn't have to spend, or spend or continue to spend in the future. All right? And you can say, well, Tom, that's like crying over spilt milk. You know, uh, why, why cover that? I cover it because we still do it. The practices that I'm going to cover right now, um, we can't get out of. And so what I'm suggesting is these bad practices that we're going to discuss, let's stop them. Okay? Let's not do them anymore. And it will, re it will reap us a huge benefit. And You've already discussed a few of them in your in your own observations. The first is corruption. The cost of corruption. Now we know that Chicago is the most corrupt city in America, right? This is not a surprise to you. We're number one. <laughs> yes, according to Professor Dick Simpson, who is the chief author of our first article, who's been studying this for 40 years. <laughs> and he re routinely repeats and reports on how many folks from this jurisdiction go to the pokey or public officials. And his numbers consistently prove out this jurisdiction is the most corrupt. And that, that includes Mississippi and New Jersey and other cesspools uh, of incompetence. So we asked him, I know, Dick, you've been covering all this for years, but could you put a number on it? Is it possible? to tell us how much the citizens are being fleeced through these corruptions. And he also breaks that down. So when we say corruption, it's a very broad uh, label, but he describes it in some detail. But briefly, I would say it's the traditional ghost payrollers. So in other words, you're paying someone for not working. It's outright theft. I had, I had uh, 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 a meeting with a guy who was a current employee at the water department not too long ago, and he said, well, you know, when we buy a, like a, you know, a generator, you know, we buy three of them. The supervisor takes one home, I take one home, and one goes into the shop. You know, that's like ho-hum, outright theft. And then there's the opportunity cost. What happens when you're, you're supposed to do a job, but you're not, that someone else has to do your job for you. He's doing two jobs. He can't do them both well, and so public service suffers. So there's a loss there, an opportunity loss. Anyway, I said, Dick, how much are we talking about? The answer, $500 million a year. $500 million a year, year in and year out. Take your and Take your tape on the background. You know what? I don't know what's going on here. Let's try this. Let's try this. We give it a little spine. Put your tape on the top. Put the Russians are behind it. Yeah. Yeah, if you would press this forward. Hey, you're done, yeah. honey. Yeah. Make this work. Hell of high water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully that will do it. All right. Okay. $500 million. Are you surprised? No. No. <laughs> and he says, he says that's conservative. <laughs> it's conservative. So, what's the answer to that? Well. You know, it's simple to say stop the corruption. 
but you need a mayor who is a, who would be an anti-corruption, you know, maniac. And to in order to get to the bottom of it, we probably need a forensic audit on the city, or sometimes called a performance audit. What do I mean by that? I mean you're looking at every employee and every contract and every transaction. And you're asking a couple of basic questions that you would ask if, you, if, if it was your business. Is the person qualified? You know, is there, is there a job description? How did the person get hired? Is the person physically there doing the job? You know what I'm saying? Pretty basics. Um, is, is the uh, bidding process valid? In other words, are we giving the jobs to the highest bidder or the lowest bidder? Or is it the mayor's friend or the alderman's brother or something like that? Eliminating all conflicts of interest so that aldermen don't hold other jobs, which they do. So you, you can be an alderman and a lobbyist and a lawyer and a tax lawyer and a property lawyer. No, can't do that. So you know what I'm saying? It sounds simple, but it'd be hard, it would be very complicated and would rip a lot of our uh, powerful people would, would sort of throw it out in the street, or, as it were. And so they're not going to be for it, even though they would say, oh, I'm not for corruption. All right. So the very first idea that we have in the book is already, it already sounds like revolutionary, you know, this idea of stopping corruption. It sounds like it would be an, a, an impossible dream. All right, the second uh, item we cover under this first bucket is bad bank deals, which you guys already mentioned. And uh, that chapter is written by Jackson Potter, who is the chief of staff at the CTU. And uh, Jackson is particularly ex exercised about the toxic swaps. Excuse me. So this is a kind of a deal in which uh, the Board of Education placed a bet on the market, thinking it would go one way, and they lost. <laughs> but it wasn't their money. It was your money. And it was the future of our children. So when they cut schools and when they cut the libraries and when they and they cut and cut and cut why because they spent a billion dollars to these banks so a billion dollars in fees went to these banks did they earn these fees no they, they, they pushed some paper around now jackson went to the mayor and asked him a simple question can we not renegotiate and again those of you that own homes you follow the finances. If the bank, uh, if the loans and the interest rates go down, don't you renegotiate? Tell me that you renegotiate. Why would you pay more? Well, I don't know about you, but at the, the Trusser family have renegotiated eight times. Uh, and we just paid off our mortgage after 19 years. But when we started, the interest rate was over 8%. We got it down to, to below 4 that's because my wife is a tough negotiator. She's got the financial genius in this family, and when she would read about how these rates would lower, she would go right to the bank and say, You've got to re we got to refinance. I'm not paying you a dime more than I have to. That's common sense. Well, the mayor doesn't seem to be able to do that, and what he said to Jackson was, a contract is a contract, meaning, I'm sorry, we're stuck. However, those of you that are, pun are, are pensioners or people that used to work for public uh, service know that the state and the city is asking you to give up your pension rights and to take less, aren't they? And hasn't the mayor and the governor painted a picture of public employees as evil or greedy or somehow responsible for the, the, the finances of the state? You just did your job. You were hired to be a teacher or a policeman or a factory work or a, you know street worker or whatever whatever you did for this for this for the state an administrator what have you and the deal was you would get a pension uh, you know when you retired that contract apparently we can walk away from it. but not going with the banks all right Jackson Potter has that has that chapter and he, you know uh, he explains it pr pretty clearly now the guy who put us into those deals was a guy named David Vitale David Vitale is a very successful financier and a banker, and, and in private life he's made a boatload of money. But he was brought in by Mayor Daly to be the uh, head of the Board of Ed, I think, twice. And apparently when he got to the Board of Ed, he lost his mind and forgot his financial chops and put us into these bad deals. 
and he's not there anymore. All right. This is just not meant to be. All right, forget it. You just have to, you just have to follow along with me. I'm going to have to... Uh, Can I try to read that while you're talking? Yes, by all means. Right on the back. Boy. Uh, that, that's that's the wimpiest signboard I've ever had. <laughs> it's like a joke signboard. All right. Number two, as I said, was bad bank deals. So the remedy is get out of them. Okay. Just go to the bank and say we're done paying you. Sue me. You know. And if I was the mayor, I would I would be calling my brothers and sisters in the top twenty you know cities in America, and say collectively, um, you know, do we deal do we do, do business with Bank A, Bank B, Bank C? And let's just tell them we want better, a better deal, or you're not going to get our business, right? So collectivism works, and I don't see why the city of Chicago shouldn't be doing the same thing. All right, but they're not. Okay, so the remedy is renegotiate, back out, get a better deal. You'll save another, at least a billion. Okay, third part, you've already mentioned that, police violence. Uh, it's the saddest chapter in the book, and you can't put a price on a lost life of a young person who's, who's been shot, but you can put a price on our settlements and the reparations. When, when the young La Laquan McDonald was shot, in an effort to keep, them, to keep the whole thing under wraps, the mayor rushed a $5 billion settlement to the family. They didn't even ask for it, but they took it. But the idea is to hush it up. And of course, they sat on the video for over a year. And when the video was released finally, it caused a sensation. And the question is, what did the mayor know and when did he know it? And do you believe he saw the, the video before you did? Oh, yeah. Pretty much everybody I talked to believes that. Uh, so he's such a control freak that uh, it's hard to believe that his people didn't know everything about that video within a half an hour you know, of the incident. In any case, um, putting that aside for a moment, um, $5 million went to, to, the, to the family of Laquan McDonald, but another 650 went to all the other uses and problems, including the John Birch torture cases. And those still are unwinding. That bill has not been settled yet. And the guy who, who wrote the story on the, the John Birch uh, stories for the reader for all those years told me, he said, John Burge was only one. There are many others. So we don't even know where this trade is going to stop. There are others out there who have yet to be brought to justice, and maybe we'll, you know, God forbid, we'll never know. But here's the guy who broke the story on John Burge, is telling me that there's at least two other police commanders who did as much as Burge did and worse. And, and I guess time will tell. All right. So let's stop that. There's a, there's a settlement in the works between the police and the city of Chicago. Uh, it doesn't cover everything that needs to be covered. So the question is, well, oh, you got to control yourself. Um, I need another chair. That chair is. So, thank you. This crew is working hard behind the scenes here. Um, yeah, I'm fine. I got another one, liability award. Excuse me, here's a different chair. All right. So if I haven't depressed you enough already, we'll continue on. She just brought me the second the second bucket is um, money that is being hidden from us. We can't find it. We know they're collecting it. We know they're collecting this money, we just can't put our hands on it. And this is where I write about TIFs, tax increment financing. So that's my particular um, fetish, if you will. As I say, I've been on the beat for quite a few years. Uh, but let's just say this about tax increment financing. It's a giant slush fund, ladies and gentlemen. It's a giant piggy bank controlled by the mayor and his allies that dispenses tasty cash gumballs to projects that he or, and his allies prefer. And um, in the loop alone, that highly blighted area, $850 million 
in property taxes to developers of loop buildings, including the Chicago Title and Trust, including the PepsiCo headquarters on the West Loop. We're going to take questions after us. Right. I'm not questioning. Uh, a moment ago, you said John, I believe you said John Burge. But it sounds like you said John Birch. 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 John Birch is his name. All right, so tax increment financing uh, takes about uh, $460 million off the table every year. We just did the 2017 TIF report, and that information is on our website, and you can check it out at www.tif.com. Reports.com. Four hundred and sixty million. Now, that's just in one year. But as I said before, there's a balance sheet. So, at the end of 2017, the TIF accounts uh, is 145 TIF, TIF districts. At the end of 2017, there was $1.44 billion sitting in those accounts. Did you all know that? No, no way you could know it, but now you do. So, almost $1.5 billion sitting in the TIF accounts at the end of 2017. I'll write that number here, $1.44 billion on one one eighteen. So what we're proposing is simply end the TIF program, cancel it. If you did that, all that money would flow back into the system, going to the units of government that would have got that tax money in the first place. So if you think about your property tax bills, you'll remember that which is the agency that takes the most of your property tax dollar? Pension. No. In the city agencies, city units of government. <coughs> yes, the Board of Education takes 56 cents of each dollar collected. Okay, so when you when you spend a dollar from your property taxes, if you look on the yes, on the bill, but, uh, it's about 56 cents about that goes to the Board of Education for its uses. So therefore, you, if a dollar goes missing. Okay, if a dollar of property taxes goes missing, who loses the most? Board of Education. Board of Education. Okay. So, following this logic, what's five, what's 56% of that number? Seven. You call it, call it, it made 800 million. So if we ended TIFs, the Board of Ed would get a one-time infusion of 800 million dollars. Now, again, as I said before, I'm a fan of public education, so I think that's a good idea. You may disagree. You may think it should go somewhere else, but that's not what would happen. They should have gotten that money. Now, what they would do with it is also a good question. Would they use it wisely? I don't know. You know, they would need better administrators. They keep seeming keep seem to appoint people to the head of Board of Education who are criminals. Back to the corruption issue. So Barbara Bird Bennett, who was appointed by Mayor, you know, put in place by Mayor Daly, uh, Mayor, Mayor Emanuel, and approved by his Board of Education, who he approved, I mean, they're all answer to him. So Barbara Bird Bennett is in jail right now. She was, she was a criminal. But she was the head of our Board of Education, ladies and gentlemen. This is obscene. All right, let's stop doing that. You know, I'm begging the mayor or the next mayor, put people in place who are not thugs, and criminals put people in place who are world-class experts in education, transportation, housing. What a concept. People are not going to steal and rob us. But that's the kind of people who have been put in place. All right. Yeah, yeah they can be experts. So take this money and put it back to where it's supposed to go. That would be my answer to bucket number two. Money that's hidden, but we can't find it. So I'm telling us, kind of put that spotlight on it. That's why we call it the TIF Illumination Project. All right, bucket number three. We're almost getting to the end here. This is money that we're not collecting, <coughs> but we should. Bucket number three. 
Now this is where we get into our civic imagination. I find my role as an educator uh, and as, a, as someone who is in, deeply interested in raising the civic IQ of the city to, to try to expand our civic imagination, okay? Stop thinking narrowly and reject the frame of scarcity. So call it a philosophy, call it a mindset, but the civic narrative that I kept that, that, that started my journey that where Chicago is broke is one is fundamentally one of scarcity. And if you believe that, if you think, oh yeah, Chicago is completely busted, <coughs> then you're going to buy arguments of, oh, we need the Olympics here because we have no money. That's what a great idea, Mayor Daly. Bring the Olympics. It'll rain cash. Or yeah, close those schools. They're just wasting money They're on those those kids or whatever. Cut, 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 cut. That's the Republican mindset. That's the business mindset. That's the mindset of scarcity which I am fighting, okay? So, these three ideas are in that camp, I guess. All right, the first idea is an old one, a progressive income tax for the state of Illinois. Now, why is that on this list? Well, Illinois has one of the worst income taxes in the country. <clears throat> By some counts, it's the fourth worst. What does that mean? It means it's taking money from the poor guys and not the rich guys. It's taking money in an unprogressive or fundamentally unfair way, which is one of the reasons why this Illinois, Illinois is always in the shitter. We're underfunding our government. And Illinois is a wealthy state. I mean, our economy is equal to like Brazil or something. I mean, we've got like the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, you know. California is up there as well. But in terms, of, in terms of a state with resources, this is a wealthy state. This is a state with much resources. We've got, I don't know, 20, I, I, I lost count, 20, 25 billionaires. The Pritzker family alone, between JB and his cousins and uncles or whatever, the Prisker family alone is $16 billion. One family. All right. Now what the League of Women Voters, that radical group of women, they're so crazy, <laughs> what they've been fighting for for a generation is a progressive tax for this whole state. And they have shown conclusively, repeatedly, exhaustively that this is a winning idea. It's not a business killer, as the Chamber of Commerce would have you believe. It's what's necessary. So over in Kansas, where Governor Brownback did this, his state is a complete catastrophe. He cut, he cut, he cut, he cut. Whereas over in Minnesota, the governor there put a progressive tax, put more money in the coffers, they have a surplus, there's more money for schools, there's more money for teachers, stupid things like health care, mass transit, and all these crazy things. All right. So what the legal women voters are saying, a progressive income tax for the state will help the city. Because we do revenue share. And that would be great for the city, but also the state's share of education would go up. So there'd be more equity across the whole state in our city if everybody got more money, not just Glencoe or uh, Hinsdale, or where there's wealth. So right now, the state of your, of your public education is tied to the wealth of your community. That's not right. Is it? It's, it's, it? it's a lottery. If you're born to a community where there's, a wealth, where, there's, where there's wealthy properties and shopping malls, those are generating property taxes that fund your schools to the tune of $12,000 a kid, your, count, your campus, and believe me, I've been there in the suburbs, they look like college campuses. They want for nothing. <coughs> Arts, music, the most up-to-date computers, the things that you would want for your own children, and your neighbor's children, they have an abundance in these wealthy districts. But you go around the city of Chicago, my friends, and you find children learning in broom closets. You find rats, you find it's, it's unconscionable. And part of what we're saying with this first idea is a progressive tax will help cure that. All right. It's necessary for a modern state. All right, second idea, now we're getting a little, little off, we're getting a little out there now, is a financial, Transaction tax. Need a box? Yes, please. On LaSalle Street. <clears throat> now, we know 
that these guys down on the South Street are making money, right? It's a little esoteric for me. I'm, I'm, I'm really not a finance guy. But let me write this number on, the, on this paper, and let's see if we can de decipher it. This is a one with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 zeros. Does anybody know what that number is? Trillion. Someone says a trillion. Quadrillion, I it's a, baz a bazillion. That's like a kid. A kid is there. Like, oh, it's a what? Quadrillion. Quadrillion. You give up. Quintillion. Quintillion. Why is that number important? That's how much value is traded on the exchange every year. One quintillion. Dollars. No tax. Pod to tax. You come into the restaurant and you buy a, a pancake. You pay a tax. You buy a bottle of water at the grocery store. Tax. You buy a jacket. Right? Now, if you're wealthy, maybe you can avoid these taxes by, like, I don't know, driving to Iowa or something and buying a, 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 a boatload of cigarettes or something you know, on an Indian reservation to escape taxes. But most of us can't do that. We're stuck living here. And as you said before, we got red light cameras. We got a lot of regressive ways to make money in the city. Six bucks in Algonquin for a pack of cigarettes. There you go. Thirteen dollars in uh, downtown. Load me up. We're going, to, we're going to Algonquin. All right. So what we're saying here, the professors that wrote this chapter are proposing the following. Put a dollar on the seller and a dollar on the buyer on every contract. And they're even getting more focused by saying, let's only do the contracts that we have a monopoly position on here in the city of Chicago. Things that you can't trade in other markets. So they ran the numbers for the year that was available to them when they were writing the article. And they came up with a staggering number of like $24 billion in one year if we did what they're proposing. And we said, okay, how would we, how would we portion that out? What would be a fair, reasonable way to do it? And we just, for argument's sake, we just said, let's give that money to the city of Chicago in proportion to the population that we possess of this whole state. So it's a statewide issue. So we would say, Money would be spent to get to the state for its uses, and money to the county, and then money to the city. So well, we said, let's start the conversation there. And if we followed that formula, Chicago would get $2.2 .2 billion every year. OK. That's a big number to me, you know? All right, last idea. We're almost done. And this is probably the idea that gets the most uh, eyebrows raised, and that is a public bank. So what is a public bank? This is a bank that works for the public's good and not for profit and avarice and greed and to, to rape and pillage you. So let's not send any money to Wall Street. We've done that already. We've, we've sent them plenty of our money. Let's keep our money here and let's use it to recirculate amongst ourselves, to benefit ourselves. So essentially what a public bank does is make credit available very cheaply. And do we have an example of this crazy idea? And yes, we do. The Bank of North Dakota. So all you have to do is Google that. And this is an institution owned by the good people of the state of North Dakota. It's been in our existence for over 100 years. 100 years, and North Dakota is a prairie, Republican, somewhat conservative state, agricultural and base. Very similar in some ways to Illinois, but something in their past, which is worth looking at, caused them to create this institution, which has served them so well for so long. No small bank in North Dakota has failed in over 15 years. 
Whereas in Chicago, we've lost many, including uh, the South Shore Bank, which served the African American community very well and was, a, was a, served as a startup and a place to, to finance people's businesses and homes. But we've lost most of the banks that serve the black population in Chicago. They're gone. We couldn't figure out what, how to save them. That wouldn't have happened had we had a bank of Chicago. The author of that article is Amara Enya, who just announced for mayor last week. So Amara points out that amongst the other benefits of a public bank would be to self-finance our own infrastructure. So the very first thing that was put on our list of crappy decisions was the parking meters. To get a billion dollars in ready cash, we didn't have to do that. If we had a public bank, we could have financed our own infrastructure repairs, whatever they would be, whether it's a new red line extension to Indiana, or resurfacing the streets, or replacing the lead yeah, pipes that are underneath our sidewalks that are poisoning our children and ourselves. We could finance that ourselves. <coughs> And what Amara points out is that when you do a deal, like borrow money for a bonding or, or to build the bridges and whatnot, there's usually about a 25% upcharge that you're sending to Wall Street. Hold on, I'll be so back. she says, in other words, if you're, if you're trying to build something like extend the red line and it's a billion dollar project, you're spending another 250 million just for the finances. That's, that's money that's going to Wall Street. So we would save that money. I don't know about that. Sounds pretty, pretty good to me. Anyway, look at our Bank of North Dakota. They return profits to the state every year. And just to make it even more real, uh, we did some research to try to understand what would be the benefits for a student taking a loan. So those of you with kids in college and are holding loans, this should hit you right at home. A student going to the in-state University of North Dakota, getting a loan backed by the Bank of North Dakota, versus a student from Chicago going to the University of Illinois, getting a loan from the Bank of America. When we were doing the research on, on that day, when we were writing this article, we just went to their calculators and just came up with, you know, put in the numbers and this is, this is what the deal was. The bottom line is the student in North Dakota was going to save five to eight thousand dollars for the same, you know, kind of transaction for the same kind of experience. Which meant that that student or her parents was going to have five to $8,000 more in their pockets, which they would invest in, presumably, in North Dakota. They might buy a car, they might have bought their house, they might have, who knows? But you multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands of students and you begin to understand why North Dakota is so healthy financially. Okay. So those are the ideas. You add them all up, put them all together in terms of savings and new revenue. The total is five billion dollars per year. Per year, more or less. Okay. There's a little irregularity because because the TIF ones once they're gone they're gone, but thereafter. It's in that ballpark. So the book came out in 2016. The League of Women Voters delivered it to all the aldermen and to the mayor. But the mayor has had no public meetings on his budget in two years. <laughs> so you old timers remember Mayor Daly when he used to do his budget hearings? He would usually take him to a city college or something. Those of that, 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 that have gone down that path will remember. They put a microphone up. And uh, people would go to the mic and they have maybe two minutes. And Mayor Daly was there with his people. And they would take to the mic, oh, Mayor Daly, you suck, da, da, da. You know, Mayor Daly, I love you, you're great. And they just, you know. And then when they were done, they <laughs> took their stuff and went home. Which Mayor Daly? The second. Uh, and that was their charade that they did around budget hearings. Now, this mayor doesn't even do that. And for two years, there's been no public meetings. But this right here today, is our 63rd meeting around the book. So we're doing more to try to elevate a conversation about budgets with no resources than the mayor and all his people have done. OK? So that's it. Chicago is not broke. If we follow these ideas, we have about $5 billion more to play with. 
But again, that's just money. It has to be put into the service of justice and your values, which leads us to, you know, our current political situation. Mayor Emanuel shocked us all by denouncing that he's not running. So now we have a chance to replace him with somebody who might follow these ideas and give us a city that we deserve, a city of justice, beauty, and peace for everyone, where everyone prospers, not just the mayor's friends, campaign donors, and future employers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes my presentation. Now we'll take old. questions. Stay up there, you'll take questions. Just keep well, well, sorry. Yeah, I don't think this is working. Uh, it, 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 he's got it down low, but what's, hello, hello. You got the volume down a little bit. No, it's up. It's just really fuzzy. Um, okay. We'll Might have, need new batteries, too. I don't know. Um, it probably needs a nine volt. Well, uh, can you guys uh, yell your questions and you be loud? Yeah. All right. Um, I think I may. Let okay. the MC, let the let MC the, run this. All right. Let me ask the first question. Sure. All right. You're, you're looking for a mayor. I'm going to go back and sit down towards the, towards the, towards the thing there. And just go ahead. Um, you know, it's going to take a man of great moral character and a woman. Or, a woman. Or, or a woman in the city of Chicago to uh, do this stuff. And the one person who I see with a real protected good record would be uh, Todd Ricketts, who gave the Chicago Cubs a World Series victory after 108 years. I'd like your comments on a Mayor Ricketts. Mayor Ricketts. Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> we got too many billionaires in government as it is. Mayor. Uh, oh yeah, Yerkes too. <laughs> yeah. okay, All right, go ahead. Um, do you want to, uh, Andy, if you're ready to moderate, uh, come on up please. Otherwise, let's start with Gene. Uh, to paraphrase what uh, Tim said, who do you recommend for mayor? The question is, who do I like? Well, someone who's not in the in the fight right now, but he may he may join, and that would be Cook County Clerk David Orr. Ooh. Oh yeah. David Orr. David Orr. <clears throat> in my opinion, he's your finest public official. He served with distinction for many years. You know, he was an alderman, an insurgent alderman from the 49th. Ah. He was mayor for one week, so he he, he he sort of got us through the passing of Harold Washington. But as a Cook County Clerk, he originally returned money. To government. He was so good. He was embarrassing to the others. And he has done so much so much for, for uh, elections and just running his, his department efficiently. He's recognized nationally as an exemplary clerk for, for, for what that means. But he's gotten much more than that. Um, and he's spoken often about a lot of these issues about what let's call them justice, equity, fairness. Um, you know, beyond what is required of him. And he's been very quiet. You know, he hasn't made a lot of waves. He just puts his nose to the grindstone and delivers excellent service year in, year out. I contrast him to Dorothy Brown, whose, whose department is a, is a shame, and she's under investigation 15 different ways. That's the old school. David embarrasses those other people. So okay. I like David. All right. Thank you. Over here. Uh, I can't get my head around getting the TIF money. But what about a casino and the legalization of uh, cannabis? Okay, two, two points uh, that we didn't consider in the book. One is legalized gambling, and the other is, say, legalized drugs or specifically legalized marijuana. Uh, you know, in another edition of the books, we probably would cover those. Personally, I am in favor of legalizing drugs, all of them, frankly, uh, and taxing them. You know, in some cities and states, uh, I think Colorado and Denver, uh, you know, it's crazy. I mean, it's a cash situation because the feds, you know, won't let the banks handle it. So it's, they've managed to solve all those problems and they're, the city of Denver is reaping enormous benefits. It has, it's becoming a tourist attraction. I mean, there's all kinds of things why I would argue that legalizing drugs is a good deal. However, I'm opposed to legalizing gambling. Maybe it's a contradiction, but when, when we've studied it, we've seen that legalized gambling is betting against your citizens. So in order, in order for that to pay off, you've got to have a lot of chumps that go in and lose their money, and that's not what a city should be about. So I would say no to that. Okay. David. Yes. Bob, please. 
Yes, first of all, among the bad decisions there, would you consider louder? Would you consider that the hired equipment and hired truck program? Hired truck scandal, absolutely. Uh, for those of you <laughs> who want to, you know, another another trip down memory lane, uh, the Sun Times broke this story in about 2002 ish, I believe, uh, and um, you know, or no, maybe it was a little later. But in any case, what was happening was. There were a group of uh, purveyors who had trucks who were being paid on the order of, I don't know, about $40 million in total to not do anything with them. And um, Mayor Daly's brother, John, who's on the Cook County Board of Commissioners, his brother-in-law went to prison. And if you want to read, uh, you want to really get feel a really uh, icky, read John Lasky's book. He was the city treasurer who went to prison. He went down partly because of that. So he, he breaks out how that happened, and it's the most venal, corrupt, yeah, horrible idea. And again, Mayor Daly was able to, to sort of escape all that. Like, I don't know what, it's not, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? But yeah, horrible thing. Okay, next. Over oh. here. Oh, um. Loud, loud so everybody can hear uh, you. I had two, two comments and. Uh, Questions? Questions. Questions. Well, um, okay, to get a progressive tax, people are saying we need a constitutional convention, and I do not believe that because uh, they have a progressive tax in Massachusetts, even though their constitution is, is the same as ours, it's a flat tax, but the uh, governor got around that, and I don't know how, but I should, uh, because Kennedy, you know, Chris Kennedy explained that in detail. So I'd like to know how you can get a progressive tax without a constitutional convention. And then how would you do a transition tax when the transitions are done on computer and they don't have to be in Chicago? Right. And if, if Chicago tried to tried to tax those transactions, they just move out of the city because they're not in here anyway. Right. They, all they do is do things by computer. So the first question is, um, is there a workaround for the uh, progressive tax that does not require a constitutional convention? And the answer is yes, we had one for a couple of years. It expired, and by handling the rates. So you could, you, could, you could figure out the rates in such a way to say, you know, people who make under 30 pay nothing. That's, you can make that the law. So yes, the, the Constitution says it's flack, but it's the legislature that sets the rates. So you can say, you know, you sort of create a, uh, a workaround, and that's what they did in Massachusetts. So you would, it would require uh, legislative action and, and push by the governor. But um, not a convention. But you know, the League of Women Voters would like us to have a convention. They would really like the, you know, the, would like the, the Constitution to be amended, but that's a tricky, long-term, yeah. painful process. It could end up not to our yeah. liking, because someone could get in there and mess you and have no abortion or something. You don't know what would happen. So mm -hmm. um, short-time fix, you need a progressive governor. And you know, uh, you know somebody, you know the the the, 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 the Culleton or the, whoever replaces him as president, and, and Madigan, whoever's the speaker, they would have to be, um, you know, on board to push the votes. The second point about um, wouldn't they just leave the the, the board of trade? Our professors uh, address that. They point out that the um, the the servers where all this is happening are like two football fields. So they might threaten to leave, it wouldn't be feasible. But we'd like to have a, a thorough debate. But as I say, no public meeting, so you know we're just debating amongst ourselves. It would be great to have the alderman call <coughs> the head of the Board of Trade and the professor, you know, have it out in a public way where the real experts are speaking. But it's my understanding that they threaten to move, but they wouldn't. Okay, next question, please. Uh, how much do we current? How much are we in the hole for pensions? And um, are new employees getting uh, pensions or four hundred one k's? So the question is, how much are we in the hole for pensions? Well, now we're leaving my area of expertise. People say it's thirty to a hundred billion dollars, depending on who you listen to, and I would say. For our, for our purposes, I would ask you to think a little differently. So back to our households, the idea of 
planning your yearly budget, your operating nut, as it were, from your, from your income, part of that includes debt at some time. So you're thinking, well, I, I do have a car, and I am paying a loan on it. So in thinking of your, of your expenses going forward, sometimes you're, play, you're paying off debt, whether it's a mortgage or a, or a car, something of this nature, student loan. But the, the problem is we don't quite trust the, the, the numbers that are coming from the, from the mayor. He appoints these commissioners who run these pensions. And so to me, it's a little snarky. I would like, I'm not saying there isn't a crisis. I understand it. But I would feel much more comfortable if we had that independent audit first to make sure that they're making wise decisions with the pension month, funds. Because I feel there's a self-dealing and collusion. But even so, even if it's even if they're all fantastic pension managers and there's no mission gas, there's no collusion, there is debt. Well, let's start, you know, the sooner we start this, the sooner our bucket starts to fill up. And we can put some of this new money aside and start to pay down this debt and make sure we're straight, you know, on our pension debt. But every year that we go by that we don't deal with this and we just stay with red light cameras and all the things that you talked about that you hated that takes us further down a path that we don't want. Are new employees getting pensions? I don't know. I'm sure they are until they until they until we learn until otherwise. We, until we don't have them. Right here. Yeah, question about that. It's just everywhere, cities and counties and municipalities, states, everywhere's got the county mounting that's all the time. Where's the bubble on this? Where, where are we going with this? Where's where are we going? Well, I guess we're into another kind of meta question that we don't address in the book. But I think it's something that you guys could think about, and I, I think we should perhaps add it to the next edition, and that is what I call connecting the dots. So we are a city in a state in a country, so we can't quite to go it alone, though we have quite a lot of resources I'm demonstrating to you. You know, many cities don't have what we have. But we are part of the United States of America, and as long as the United States of America is at war, I don't know how many wars we're fighting now, with a, with a defense budget of a trillion dollars. Um, as long as we cut taxes for the wealthy, again, back to the, you know, unfair. As long as our country is operating that, it places a strain on our cities and counties in the way you're speaking of. Now, my research says that for every dollar that is sent from Illinois to the federal government, you know, in terms of our taxes going to Illinois, going to, the, to Washington, we get 78 cents back. So we send them a dollar, and we get 78 cents back, whereas Alabama, Georgia, and other states in the South go from a dollar 20 to dollar 70. Why? Because that's where the defense industries are located. That's where the Army bases are. So what we're doing is we're shifting money. It's, 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 it's a reverse engineering. It's, 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 we're bleeding money because of these bad national priorities. And we can only last so long. So even, even if Chicago were to, to take all these ideas and implement them, we're still heading, I think, in a bad direction because of your point. So America needs to demilitarize, yes. and we need to keep our money here. So I, the, my research says that that transaction that I'm speaking of, where we send a dollar and 78 cents back, it turns out to be about a deficit in Illinois of about $8 billion a year. And about two-thirds of that is from Chicago. So you can imagine on top of everything else that we've spoken about, there's another two to three billion dollars that we're just shipping to the South every year. So we'll keep that here. You, you, said, you said that we could walk away from the pension plan. The Supreme Court disagrees with you. We got this three percent compound interest. It's breaking the bank. It's ballooning our debt, right? No, I didn't say that. I, I said the mayor and his people want us to renegotiate those deals, and they want people to, to do with less. I didn't say I didn't say we should walk away from them. I heard you. No, no, I said the mayor is saying that. I'm not saying that. No, I believe a pension, the contract that we have with you as a, as an employee, is, it should be honored. We shouldn't walk away. Charlie. Yeah, Tom. Doesn't a public bank facilitate the sale of sale and privatization of infrastructure? as well as facilitate the contracting out public employee positions? Public bank is a public institution, so it would be the opposite of that. The opposite? Yeah. yeah. This is a bank owned by us, the people. We own the bank. They work for us. Yeah. 
So sell our stuff. No. If we need, if we need, if we need to raise money for the red line, I'm saying the public bank can finance that and not send the money to Wall Street. It's the opposite of privatization. Yeah. So instead of paying Wall Street two hundred fifty million dollars on a billion dollar uh, construction project, we sell finance. We keep. We're not paying two hundred fifty million. Now, for the student loan issue, the student loan uh, example, the interest that is being uh, generated by the student is much less than they were giving to the Bank of America, but it's not zero. So we're not saying to the student from North Dakota, you're getting a completely free ride, you're getting a, a modest I don't really loan. care about the students. All I know oh, is Jesus. they could sell CTA tomorrow, this is and this would facilitate it, I believe. Not, not in my world. No, I'm not for that. I don't advocate that. This is for the opposite of that, Charles. This is for, for self-financing public infrastructure and not paying onerous debt to Wall Street. So I'm for more mass transit, and this is how to pay for it. Or a, a very viable way to pay for it. Anyway. In the back there. Um, how, uh, there are a lot of examples of corporations that have com have uh, forced states uh, to compete against each other and even moved corporate offices offshore to escape taxation. What would prevent um, your plan to basically fail by seeing um, uh, the stocks and options, the commodities market move out of the city or out of the state? Right, so there is a race to the bottom that you correctly point out. Uh, we're, in, we're in a bidding war for Amazon headquarters too as an example. So right now, what we know about that is that the state and city are promising on the order of $2.2 billion to the world's richest man, who as of last time I checked is now worth $140 billion. This is Jeff Bezos, okay? So we're gonna give him $2.2 billion of your all's money to bring Amazon headquarters here. And um, I'm against that. So, no, if, if Amazon would like to, 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 to buy land on the open market, build whatever you want. Just don't use my money, okay? But are you, are you saying they, the, 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 the stock exchange would move if we... What prevents them from moving if they say, oh my God, Chicago's going to tax us. It's them. Yeah, to right, you got to read the book because they give a very detailed argument against why translocation is not feasible. It's quite detailed. But... There's another argument I would make that's not in the book uh, and that I've discussed in, in our public meetings, and it goes back to, again, our leadership. So if I was the mayor, I would say to J.B. Pritzker and his friends and his colleagues, and I'd say, look, you guys made your bones here. You're very doing very well. Good on you. It's the city of Chicago that made it happen. So you need to go to your friends. You know, J.B. is a serious trader. He's, he has a venture capital fund. You need to go to your friends, and you need to have a conversation. Like I said, it's a moral argument. Don't leave. Don't threaten to leave. That's bullshit. Stay here, pay your fair fucking share, and let's have a great city. But that's okay, JB, you're not gonna miss it, okay? You and your friends, whatever we're talking about, by dinging you with this dollar fee, and that's just the starting point. You know, when we get into negotiations, it'll probably end up being 25 cents a trade, you know? That's still a lot of money. What we would be saying to, 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 the, to the wealthiest class, stand shoulder to shoulder with us, with the cardinal and the rabbis and the imams and the other leaders of, 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 our, of our faith communities. It's a moral argument to say, those of you that are super wealthy, don't run away and leave us in ruins. You made your bones here. You have an obligation to the city. And I'd see where that goes, and then get get tough after that. <laughs> okay, all right. What, what year was this survey done about the, uh, the, the trading exchange? The book came out in 2016, so I believe it was it was from uh, numbers from 2015. Now, it, um, my experience, at least with the pits, you know, and just what we've got three trading exchanges here in Chicago. Four. There's nobody on the floor anymore. It's all electronic. They can do it anywhere. There's nobody there. Right. This is in the book. They, they understand that. But, I mean, so so why? I mean, there's no way you can control taxing here in the city. 
All I can say is read the arguments in the book. It's too, it's too much to go into, but they make a case for why why your your, your arguments wouldn't, wouldn't go. Raj, you have a question. Which book? Yeah. Which book? It is book. Okay, Raj. Raj. His, his book says that you can tax, you can tax traits, you know, like a or CME. In the book. Okay, Raj. And this is the book we're talking about. Remember, we're going to sell this in a few minutes. So you'll buy a copy and you'll read it. And you'll, you know, then we can argue. Okay. How much? Twelve bucks. Is there any idea that you successfully accomplish? Any idea yeah. that you accomplish? You produce the results. You pass the laws, convince the people, and got it implemented. Any idea you did that? Well, since this is the 62nd meeting in two years with no budget, no, there's no law because uh, there's been no serious public conversation. So people have taken this book and given it to their aldermen. Uh, aldermen, some candidates are looking at it. So it's up to you guys. Uh, there's only so much I can do. Uh, <laughs> only one guy, I don't even have an office. So take this book if you think it's good ideas and send it to your alderman and demand that they act on it or have a public meeting on it. Who hasn't had a question yet here? I haven't. Okay. But it's a two-part. Okay, so, no way. No way. okay, hold on. Why is Rom resigning? Is and is Rom gonna run for president? That's one part. And then two, the second part is there's a guy named Ferguson that's supposed to be in charge of all the corruption in Chicago. Is he appointed by the mayor? Is Ferguson? And should that department be I, I have no idea what the what Mayor Emanuel's gonna do. Uh, I'm glad to see the back of him, frankly. Uh, who knows what he's going to do. Um, second question, Joe Ferguson is the Inspector General. Um, his powers are limited. He can't, for example, uh, look at some aspects of city council. So uh, very unusual for a city. The workers' compensation program, which is on the order of $100 million a year, is operated by Ed Burke's Finance Committee. It's unheard of. Ferguson doesn't have the subpoena powers over him. So his powers are limited, uh, and so he has some say about corruption. But his, is he hired and fired by the mayor? The mayor, yes, the mayor appoints him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, in a perfect world, you'd have, you know, you'd have a, a, an inspector general with subpoena powers over all units of government, including city council, and enough people, you know, enough investigators and staff to truly follow the crimes and be able to prosecute them. But unfortunately, you know, our state's attorney, uh, well, Kim Fox is, is, in, is new in office, but for decades, between the attorney general in Illinois and our state's attorney here in Cook County, they prosecuted no corruption. They couldn't find any corruption because they're part of the machine. So we fired Anita Alvarez, and we're looking for more justice from Kim Fox, but Lisa Madigan apparently is not unable to find corruption, even though she has an office that deals with it. Why are is her father is the most powerful guy, you know, in the freaking country in terms of state politics. So the only reason why we had so much federal prosecution of, you know, the two governors and, and, and Jesse Jackson Jr. And, 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 and now our 32nd alderman is going to prison, who's going to go to prison, Willie Cochran, is because we had aggressive federal prosecutors. That's the only reason. In the back. Um, there's a lot of talk now about automobiles becoming automated. Cellular cabbage, beef, barley, and cream of If you think about it, it's one of the silliest investments, perhaps something you will use like 10% of the time that you pay for 24 hours a day and all the other expenses that go with it. Automobile. So you would think that calling a car up on your phone just for a ride from here to the grocery wherever you're going is something that will catch on, which means people will own less cars, which means there'll be less street parking. Were you saying with the thing? I don't know if the deal we made with the group on the parking meters means that they get paid if parking is used or not used. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I understand it, um, they are guaranteed a certain amount. Now, what that is, I'm not sure, so we, we need to look into that. But, but your idea of, of what happens as ridership goes down may be, um, you know, that may be a risk. To the to the deal because if you know car share goes up and, and people are parking less, 
However, they've been very aggressive in trying to make up new sources of revenues, as I pointed out. So, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. But they have sued us um, when the aqua high-rise was built, and there was a parking in the lower structure of the aqua. You know, it's the wavy building. Uh, and they said it, was a, it, was, it, it violated the clause of the Monroe Street parking garage, non-compete. So we weren't supposed to allow any parking to, to interfere with the Monroe Street concessions. So we had to pay, you know, who could think of such a thing by just letting a private developer build a high rise that had parking, that would be a financial hit on the city of Chicago. So these lawyers are super smart and aggressive. And I wouldn't be surprised if they found something in the fine print that would indemnify them if all of a sudden parking went down. But you raise a side question about Uber and Lyft as a, as a drain on the city. They use our public resources. They cause accidents. They, they, they wear the roads down, they, they um, are using the public way, uh, but they're not taxed or feed like taxi cabs. It's the same thing with electric So I would say you either, you're either going to, you know, if it depends if you're a libertarian or if you're for more regulation, you would either have to say there's no regulations for everybody. So, the, the, so the, the, the taxi cabs wouldn't have to have drug testing anymore or bonded or anything. Anybody could do anything. Or the Lyft and Uber drivers would have to have the same standard as your um, taxi drivers. Well, it's the same thing with electric cars. They don't pay a gas tax. You're taxed by the mile. They use the roads. You're taxed by the mile. Over here. Yeah. Are you trying to tell me that uh, the reason we had uh, several, I don't know how many uh, governors of the state in jail, but not, not mayors of the city is because the feds are eager to go after more. And the question was, is the reason why some of our, uh, many of our government officials went to prison because of the aggressive uh, federal prosecutor? Yes. So, you just, so the, the, the federal attorney for the lower part of Illinois is appointed by the president with the advising consent of the city senators. So when Peter Fitzgerald became senator back in, uh, what was that? Carol Mosley Brown was elected in 92, so six years, so 98. Peter Fitzgerald defeated Carol Mosley Brown, and it was his choice of the federal prosecutor, whose name I can't remember anymore. Patrick Fitzgerald. Yeah, okay, I thought it was so. So that fella was the guy who headed up the task forces that put Ryan, Blagojevich, Jesse Jackson Jr., and many others in prison, that guy. So he was told, you know, do your job, man. You know, find the crime and throw him in jail. And so he did it. But so the, the, the mayors are not investigated at all, or what the? Not, they escaped investigation, as far as I can see. David here. OK. I'd like to answer a question that Corinna put forward earlier. She asked whether the new hires who go to work for like the feds, the state, the county, and the city, and so on, whether they get pensions. No. If you hired after a certain date, Social Security gets taken out of your out of your salary just like everybody else, and you get Social Security. Only those people like me who left before a certain date, who were hired before a certain date, we get the pensions. Okay, so we got corrected by the brother who, who knows a little bit more about the pension situation. We one last Thank question you. here. One, one last well. question over here. All right, we're going to have to... We're getting close to rebuttals now. Yeah, about two to about three to four minutes. Uh, I, I'd like you to talk about the TIF and uh, uh, Emmanuel stealing the money out of the TIF uh, because it was supposed to be... It was designated for certain things, and it, it was not used that way. For one thing, it was supposed to be local businesses, and instead money was given to Walgreens and CBS and local drugstores went out of business and uh, because uh, because they didn't get the tip money. And then all of a sudden, Mayor uh, Emanuel decided to just steal the money and give it to, I mean, how, uh, that, that didn't get any publicity. I, he should have been called on the carpet for that. So a question about the, you know, the, the current use of TIF money. So I'm for the abolition of TIFs. I think it's irredeemable. Uh, it's a slush fund. It's fueled so much bad projects in the city, um, billions of dollars. Since TIFs were started in 1986, 
They've taken seven billion dollars in property tax. We only know where maybe half of that went. The records are not even extant from 1985, 86, all the way up to 2002. We don't even know anything about that money, mostly. Uh, so it's opaque, it's unaccountable. As you say, the, it's supposed to be for development in blighted communities. That's the, that's the legal term. But folks, this is Chicago. We have a history of racism, redlining, you know, disinvestment in our communities of color. We caused the blight. A blight has been caused on people. So who blighted who is a question. Nevertheless, that's what the tester says. But you look at where the money has actually been spent, and it's not been in communities of color or communities of need. It's been the opposite. And I would argue that many homeowners in TIF districts in poor communities are actually being leached of money that's being sent out of their communities. And I'll give you one example that's happening right now. That's in West Lawndale, which is, of course, an African-American community, and some people would say it's needy, needs help. The TIF district called the Midwest TIF has been uh, doubled in size in order to finance the expansion of the Sinai hospital system about eh, half a mile away. Okay, the Sinai hospital system, it may be a beautiful, fantastic system, but it's not free. So if you break your leg going down the stairs in your house in West Lawndale, you can't go to that hospital for free, even though your property tax money is going there to fund the expansion. That's fundamentally wrong. So TIF money is not my friend. The last question. Want to know if you know where the Daly family money came from? They apparently didn't get caught in corruption, but you know how 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 are they wealthy? <laughs> well, that's beyond my purvey. I do know that Mayor Daly Senior operated under the following dictate. He said to his friends, or it's been recorded that he said, "Look, you can either have money or power." And Mayor Daly and his son believed in power. So they kept their hand, their personal hands clean. But if you look at the record, going back 40 years, dozens and dozens of people who worked for the mayor and around the mayor, and the aldermen and city clerks and judges had gone to prison. So the people they surround themselves with got dirty and many of them got caught and served, their, served prison terms. But the two dailies themselves kept themselves clean. Now the brothers, who's, who's a lawyer, and, and, and those guys are making a lot of money. Bill Daly is a, you know, he's a millionaire. He uses his influence. He was the head of SBC Midwest, right? So, um, you know, when Rahm uh, left Congress and left the, the Clinton White House, he got hired, and one of the deals he did was on behalf of Bill Daly. I think he he helped the, 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 the purchase of a security firm, like I don't know, it wasn't ADT, it was something that SBC bought. And anyway, in two years, Mayor Emanuel, for his financial dealings and his acumen, made $18 million. Yeah. So Emanuel is wealthy today because of his connections to the dailies and their, their web of influence. You know, it's not that, I mean, Mayor Emanuel is a smart man, of course, but it, it, is he worth $18 million in two years? I don't think so. So that's part of the answer is influence and connections. Okay. All right, wrap it up. Okay. All right, give let's give another hand, please. Buy yeah. books, everybody. Buy books. Come on, buy okay. books. Books for twelve dollars a piece. If anybody wants one, uh, they're going fast. So uh, help yourself here. If you got twelve dollars, and uh, how many people want to give a red bottle? Hold your hands up. Let's keep your hands up so I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, come on up. Uh, we four minutes. Get three minutes for a quick rebuttal. Let's go four. We don't have that time. Okay, There's three. 12, 12 or 13 All people right, want stand in front of the sign. Stand in front of the sign. Ready? Ready. Set, go. Who's coming up? You know what? I, I, I meant, uh, me. We should have put the, the uh, billions of dollars that uh, their kickbacks from uh, airport uh, expansions. That was that was a big scheme too. Anyway, uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, I think this fellow, former member, was correct. Uh, Chris Cungus, huh?
Steve Conjus. Yeah, we just we just need we really gotta start having um, term limits. Why? Period. Why? Well, I'm, oh. I'm sorry because there's just too. It's just a natural corrupting so situation. Not corrupt, huh? More corrupt. And we need new ideas. You don't need to be in office more than ten or twelve years. Why? Why not? Well, you're an establishment guy. You want to have your, uh, you know, connections. Experience is... Oh, the hell with experience. Okay, let's, let's have Trump in power for 12 years. Yeah, yeah. we do brain surgery. So I'm I think this yeah, shirt... One more at a time. I'm glad Tim wore this shirt last week because now I'm thinking it might be the only solution to all the corruption in America and Chicago. By the way, I thought our Chicago budget was only $6 billion. How did you come up with twenty billion? Ah. Am I supposed to answer that? Well, I think. Well, he, you can answer it in a rebuttal. What he said was all combined, all the agencies. Yeah, I know what he like said. Like the park I district. Think, I think that's six billion. No, it's, no, it's twenty. Just look okay, look at the two thousand eighteen budget. All right. Um, sit down. You got nothing to say. No, shut up. <laughs> <You're a> big <laughs> bully. No, no, hey, he's learning from Trump. He's learning from you, you Charlie. You're the establishment guy. Oh, okay. okay. All right, keep going. All right, so um, yeah, obviously we have to, you know, we have to enforce these inspector, uh, do more federal prosecutions, and have a bigger inspector uh, department. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I just I, I'm thinking more and more that the, this is the way to go. Just term limits. Ridiculous. Pat Quinn. Oh, okay, you tell Pat Quinn he's ridiculous. Yeah, I will. You're an establishment yeah. guy. You trust the, the mainstream media. I'll tell, I'll tell you and him. Get, Get rid of that heckler, Pat. No <laughs> personal attacks. <laughs> Next speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm David Travis. I'm sure you all know me. I um, I want to say that some years ago like about 10 or 12, uh, Pam Zeckman did an expose on corruption in Chicago. And one of the particular places that she talked about was in Bridgeport, a place called Pharaoh's on uh, right by Wentworth and 31st Street. And uh, she came onto his parking lot and caught him doing things for his restaurant uh, and she said, Tommy, why aren't you working? These are working hours. What's the matter with you? And Tommy Firo went like this. And uh, he wouldn't answer. But nothing ever came of it. Tommy Firo's still there, to my knowledge, unless he's retired. He still works for Department of Streets and Sanitation. Uh, I want to say that... Uh, where I think our speaker is dead wrong is for he wants to cure the ills of all of the things that are wrong by having more money go to the government. Uh, a public bank, uh, which by the way our constitution forbids, and that uh, state way up north that he talks about, they've been in violation of the constitution ever since they started doing that. Uh, they, um, they do, he, wa he wants to have all of these other things where people will pay in more money, like a tax on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, stock market and that. When Ronald Reagan ran for president the second time, uh, his opponent said he was going to tax the corporation and, and the corporations, and Ronald Reagan laughed and said, They'll just pass that on to the people, and so will the stock market. It's bad idea all the way around. So taxing, taxing uh, uh, other people or setting up other things isn't going to solve the problem. Uh, this microphone is falling apart. It's, it's uh, I also want to say that uh, I had an excellent, what I thought was an excellent idea uh, when Rahm Emanuel was first elected. I said that uh, I had an idea that would be beautify the city, 
uh, raise money for the city and make the city a safer place to uh, for vehicles. And that was to have this, to have it when people have an accident, to make them pay a $100 cleanup charge and that the streets and sanitation would be quickly dispatched to sweep up the debris when a car, when a car or more cars get in an accident and make them pay a $100 charge. Now, uh, the thing is, at that time, since that time, and at this time, when I drive, I drive over broken plastic, broken glass, uh, bro uh, metal parts of cars and so on that are all from accidents that lay in the street and lay in the street and lay in the street. Now, I thought my idea would be a real good idea. You know who I was able to get to listen to that idea? Absolutely no one. The city of Chicago is quite corrupt. They don't give a damn, and they're going to keep right on not giving a damn and keep right on fleecing the public. That's the way it's been, that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be. Thank you. Thank you. No remedy, no solution. That's the way it's going to be. Okay, I hope somebody's checking the time. I am. Uh, good, okay, thank you. Uh, put my, your hand on my shoulder when I get to two minutes. Uh, of course, uh, I mentioned the book, uh, The Chicago 77. Uh, I didn't mention West Garfield Park. Of course, I, even though I don't know the city well, I know where that's at. It's at Madison and Pulaski. The city wanted to drop $95 million on that community. How did they want to do it? Did they ask the community, oh, let's have a community meeting. Uh, we want to drop 95 million bucks on this community. What would you people like? Would you like some uh, streets fixed? Uh, would you like a, a new school? How about a park? No. They said from the top, that's called, I call it oligarchy, they said we're going to build a cop academy here, 95 million bucks. We're going to put a bunch of people who are training to be policemen here, and you better like it. That's what's wrong with our city. Well, democracy would say, ask the community you, what Mayor. you want. Here's how much money you get. Why don't you uh, decide to do something with this? No. They did it from the top. Uh, I guess uh, Man uh, Mayor Emanuel is not the worst guy in the world, but I'll tell you what, he doesn't believe much in democracy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This won't take long. Next Tuesday. 9-11, 17th you. anniversary of 9-11. I am claiming for myself, and I ask you and anyone else, to claim fasting, reflection, and prayer about what went on there and all the stuff we've gone through. Let's take some steps toward peace. That's it. Yeah. Um, in 1980, or about, Reagan came into office, and his basic philosophy was, let's, down, let's downsize the economy, let's downsize the government, and we ought to take the government and be able to drown it in the bathtub. What he meant by that was, let's do away with Social Security, let's do away with Medicare, let's do away with pensions, let's do away with um, people's rights in all different ways, 
and let's uh, get a lot of money out of the things that have been run by the government. Well, they come up with the philosophy of neoliberalism. Now, liberalism sounds very good, but by neoliberalism, what they meant was let uh, the government and the uh, and the people that live in the country do away with their uh, rights and privileges. And so now what we have is neoliberalism, let's say like, uh, like the money you put in, in the thing there for parking your cars, the parking meters. So what they done was to make the corporations richer, they privatized it. And by privatizing it, that's what they want to do with everything. So they want to privatize Medicare, they want to privatize Medi Medicaid, they want to privatize anything they could get their hands on, and that way the corporation's profits will soar to the ceiling. So you have people like this Bezos and uh, different um, multi-billionaires that are getting richer and richer. They're supposed to be about three individuals that have as much wealth as half the population in the United States. One of them is Bezos. The other one is, I forget his name, from Seattle. And then there's another one that owns Gecko. So what they're actually doing when they say, let's drown government, is do away with the government um, activities that benefit poor people and let's give that money to the rich. So that's why the rich are getting richer and richer. That's what's happening in the United States. And if you don't understand it, you won't understand what's going on. And that's why you have people running now, like for instance, not running exactly, but this the new uh, candidate for, for uh, being the judge, and he's real reactionary. And they're trying to uh, make the uh, Supreme Court very reactionary. So if something comes up, it goes to the Supreme Court, and they judge it on behalf of the corporations. That's what it's all about. All right. Here, you just lost it. Just lost it. Those are good. I hope it was. Something against the rich. My name is Raj Patel. I like I like all these complaints. I prefer people who have solutions. People who have complaints, they solve the problem and solve the problem. And I think that would be nice. As far as corruption is concerned, corruption is everywhere, and it's going to be there, and I'm not going to chase for it, let, uh, let uh, people who are assigned to work there, let them do it. I don't think it does any good for us to talk and the corruption is there. Corruption is there, what Republican thinks, democratic corruption, if Democrats don't think so, it's corruption, it's a social service. Other thing I want to say, I want to say is that whatever you want to say about Chicago's mayor, Emmanuel has done a good job, and uh, city of Chicago looks good. Quiet. Hey guys, I'm speaking. I've got the mic. One four. And uh, everybody can have their own opinion. And he's not a perfect. He likes money too. Okay. And he might have done. He might have done it. But I don't think, I don't think, he cares for Chicago one. He want to be a good mayor. He want to do a good thing. He want to be remembered for a good thing. And I think where I live, and I talk to people, it looks good, okay? I mean, there are always problems. You go to any family and ask any member, there are some bitches for other people, always there. This thing, that, there. any group you go, the same thing, we big people here all the time. But it doesn't mean that everybody is bad. There are lots of good people, and the city of Chicago is working a lot better than lots of other cities. Thank you.
Okay, hi. You guys in the back, can you take it outside or something? So here we go. Two things. One is human nature. Humans just game the, game the system. Whatever it is. Be they socialists, communists, capitalists, wh whatever it is. It's in the nature of the human being to game the system. It just, just happens. That's the way we are. And trying to design a system that can't be gamed, good luck. The next thing is on um, taxes it's in Illinois. Okay, I was on a, um, an elected official, and what I learned that in that process was that taxes work this way. All the bodies in, this, in Illinois set what they call a levy. A levy is the money that they decide they need, and they usually use a budget pro process to, a, to arrive at the levy. And there are rules as to how much the levy can increase every year, but basically the levy is what they need, and that's what they, that's what they get from the county, or whoever collects. Okay? Then we have the other side of the coin is what you pay in taxes. Okay? What you pay in taxes is directly dependent on the levy. Whatever they ask for in the levy is what has to be made up in taxes. All right? What happens with TIF is that they, the, all the tax and bodies, be they schools, park districts, whatever they are, always get what they ask for because they get the levy. And that is all they ask for. They didn't ask for more, they didn't ask for less. The TIF money is extra money that's collected all right, and set aside for whatever this project is, whatever the TIF district is all about. Um, the thing about the, left, the TIF, though, is that if the TIF didn't exist, politicians would be able to increase the levy to get some of that money that you were used to paying and put it to work in their organization. Now, whether their organization is clean or game, a different question. But if you have a school district, they make a levy, they, apply, they show that le the levy's published, they give it to the county, the county collects, and then they, just because a TIF district exists within that school district's boundaries, they do not get less money. They get just what they ask for. What, what is removed is the possibility of them getting extra money that people are already paying. All right? In other words, if there wasn't a TIF, your taxes could go down. All right? But if there is a TIF, it doesn't affect. It's like if there is a TIF, the district still gets what they asked for. Okay. Thank you. Next, Charlie. Well, I don't have that much to say. Our speaker gave us interesting and stimulating talk. It's like a phone. Um, with regard to our friend there with the T-shirt, who said no incumbents. Well, I'm sorry. I don't buy the argument of term limits. We already have a system for that in effect, and they're called elections. That's number one. Number two, I agree that experience is important. Would we have thrown out Franklin Roosevelt? He served three terms and part of a fourth? No. And so I'm also, I'm in favor of keeping people in office for as long as their experience is valuable, and for as long as the people want them there. Instead, I have a better solution. To issue t-shirts that say, no Republicans. I think that pretty well sums it up, given the mess that they've made of this country. Sure. All right, let's thank our speaker. Yeah, nice to see you again. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, first of all, regarding this TIF situation, of which I know nothing about, nevertheless, I do know that in any given situation, for every example, there's a counterexample. And if you do that type of process, you never arrive at the truth. So citing examples. I also would say that 
setting the example of a hospital closing, uh, I think that's a very good use of a TIF. It laments me that a hospital closed on the south east side of the city, which are residents of those neighborhoods, including myself, can no longer avail themselves. Living in a rural area for many, many years, believe you me, a hospital, when you have one that's 150 to 200 miles away, is a very important facility. And if that's what they use TIFs for, I applaud it. And I think that's a good use. Also, I believe they're used for senior housing, but I don't know. As I said, I don't really know about this. Uh, regarding, somebody mentioned light cameras and speed cameras. Yes, they save lives. Uh, getting hit by a moving vehicle uh, offers you little or no upper chance for, for survival. And I'm sorry, if you don't know how to control your vehicle, this is, this is an objective way of measuring, assessing your performance. You cannot defeat the machine. It does not. It is not open to subjective analysis. It's called and you are guilty, and you should pay. You are not authorized to endanger my life or anyone else's. Understand that. There's no jurisdiction, no basis of ethics, or philosophy, or jurisprudence, or legal precedent that authorizes you to endanger the lives of another citizen. For your convenience, it would help. It would help if they we had the, work quite well. It would help now, if we had the about seniority, There's not one cool. study that indicates at any what given time a, a public official goes bad or a public that's like federal employees. That's ridiculous. You have absolutely no study that can tell me at what year specifically a somebody stops performing or becomes inferior. That's ridiculous. From a personal, personalist point of view, it makes no sense. It has never been established. Furthermore, if you want something done, I represent them people who got fired from their jobs. Would you like a union? Would you like a representative who had never handled a case before? Or would you like me who had done it for 35 years? Don't be absurd. It's silly. If you don't have any data, sit down and be quiet. Otherwise, I don't okay, want to hear this anymore. The other thing I want to talk about is this cop academy, which I really don't care about either way. I will tell you one thing, though. In my union, we have a, we have a training facility that I negotiated and helped get established. Half of the facility is like a Holiday Inn hotel, and the other half are, are classrooms, and we have a faculty and staff in which I serve because we know that trained officials, trained individuals, bring better results. But you want money to go for education, but then when it comes money for public employees, you say no. That doesn't make any sense. Do you think education is good, or do you think education is worthless? Which is it? Make up your mind, folks. It's a pitiful amount of money on top of it. I don't understand this. All right, thank you. Give you a hard time. Good one. Yeah. Go, yeah, I hope you get a couple more tickets. Yeah. yeah. All right, Margaret, go ahead. Now he's telling us that the book isn't $12, it's $13.25. Quiet! Hello, good evening, gentlemen and ladies, or ladies and gentlemen, or whatever. Everybody knows me here pretty much, and some people don't like me, but that's the way that goes. I wanted to talk about TIFFs, and, and first of all, if anybody is, is seriously interested, you can go to the library or go online and look up Ben Jarofsky, who writes for the Reader, and he's done a number of columns on TIFFs, including how they are abused. TIF money was used to develop the un, uh, the uh, poverty community around Wrigley Field. A lot of TIF money went into putting up that stuff that's down there. It also went into developing property around Loyola, up by Evanston. Not in Evanston, but in North Chicago, which uh, Loyola should develop their own stuff. Um, and those are just two examples of, of I, I'm not sure how many he's got, but a lot of how uh, the TIF money has been used in areas that are really not considered areas that need to be developed. 
or at least not by using city money. Um, and the second thing is about that the schools get what they ask for. Well, I was on a local school council on and off for six years, and every year we had budget cuts, and we had to fool around with the, you know, laying off of a teacher or making a reading teacher half time or any of that other kind of stuff. There's a school in Bronzeville that's called that was uh, Diet School D Y E T T, and what happened with that school is uh, is exemplary of what happened in the um, in Chicago neighborhood schools about under resourcing or de resourcing communities of color. And so what they did is the schools started to get a really good reputation in their community. It was a community high it was a neighborhood high school. They had program enrichment programs, more of their kids were graduating, more of their kids were were scoring higher on the, the standardized tests. They were doing really well. And then the city started cutting funds to them no matter what they asked for. And then they put in, without any consultation with the diet schools, when they, they, they're, they're cutting their funds, they can't offer the kids the enrichment that they need, and then they put two char then the city put two charter schools in the neighborhood. So that sucked away population from diet. Then they tried to close them, and the teachers went on a hunger strike, if you might remember to keep the school open. Now, you know, this is, this is, a, it's, a, 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 people have even suggested that, that the city wants to push out all of the minority, the people of color, low-income people from Chicago, increasing the prices of property, um, increasing the cost of living so people can't afford to live here even though they've, they've had their same house for 50 years or whatever and they can no longer pay taxes, and they're forcing them out because they're low income, and they're forcing out people of color. And so this kind of uh, institutionalized racism that we've got going for us so that we can bring in a lot of high paying jobs and high paying uh, people who are, are paid a lot so they can buy property from in our in our neighborhood, the, the the property went up. I always said we were a hundred thousand dollars behind the market when we were thinking about buying property, but property around there went up from two hundred thousand. Now it cost you three quarters of a million dollars to a million dollars to buy a house. So um, anyway, so I'm that's the way that goes. All right. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, the one thing I want to bring up, no one seems to talk about cutting expenses. We want to talk about spending more, getting more taxes. Uh, the one source of the problem we have... Put it near your the mouth. Mix, yeah, the one source of the problem we have is this 50 aldermen we got in the city. All they do is rack up money, ask for more money, waste more money. Uh, they got patriots' jobs up and down the line over there. They got a committee chairman on top of them that makes more money. They control it. And it comes to make a decision for the city, they're powerless. Mayor says, I want to do this, they do it. They, they, they don't govern anything, they don't do it. What, what service do they give us? And the fact is, you got cities like New York, which is out of four, five, five times bigger, where we are. They got so much less aldermen than we have. We, we have too much administration here, too many guys with, with their hands in the pocket. You can't get rid of these guys. They just constantly, that's, that's the big source, getting rid of some of the excess waste they have. Okay, so. All right, I'll go next. I'll go next. Oh, you, 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 right. Go ahead. Um, I uh, just two things I'd like to talk about. The first is that uh, I, I previously bought the book, I heard you speak, and I really recommend the book. Um, they talk about the budget and uh, how there's not a Chicago budget. There are, what, five, six? Five? There are six Other. different budgets for the city of Chicago. Change. Six no, different budgets. So uh, if somebody said the budget was $6 million, well, they're only thinking about a conversation they had about one of the six different budgets. It's a way that, that it confuses people. I think people, the citizens, have an obligation to, uh, to make an attempt to understand the finances in their municipal budget but the government has an obligation to not make it exceedingly complex. In the same way that the county assessor 
takes the mathematics to determine your taxes and makes it almost indecipherable. And it ends up uh, disproportionately affecting uh, uh, lower income people. It's just terrible. So I, I think that an obligation to government is really to make the, the budget and the math as, as simple to understand as possible and, uh, and for people to protest to get in the street and protest if there's all this the financial shenanigans. The other thing I want to comment on is people were complaining about speed cameras and red light cameras. The issue is not if there should be these cameras. The question is where they should be. Where, where should they be? In front of my house. Two of them. You had a chance to talk, so now it's my chance to talk. So the problem is the state law allowed these cameras to be installed as long as the municipality does studies to show that they're effective. Okay, And what's happening is these studies aren't being done. And there are some studies, private studies, that are showing that some of these cameras are, cre are increasing accidents. Oh, this is yeah. not something I'm creating. This has oh, been this has been in the media, and you can research it. Yeah. This is stuff I've read in the paper. What happens is that, for example, red light cameras, people will see a yellow light, and they will slam on their brakes because they're scared of getting a ticket. And, and so, this is this is in the paper. If you want to put fifty bucks on it, I'll bring in a copy of the. I'll look it up. You got your You want to put fifty on it? You want to put where your money where your big mouth is? Yeah, Charlie. Huh? You want to put your money where your big mouth is? No, he doesn't. Okay, so the problem is that the city isn't being honest. And there, if these things worked, they would have press releases trumpeting the success of the reduced number of accidents at these red light cameras and the, and the speeding cameras. Instead, what happens is that they're revenue machines, and they're disproportionately taxing poor uh, people in poor income neighborhoods. And it is a racket. I'm not against them. If they do the studies that show the cameras are placed in places where they reduce accidents, I'd be all for them. Thanks. All right, right behind you. We have to prove that speed cars are dangerous. Yeah, this is an amazing thing. Uh, I also bought a copy of the book. And uh, I also bought a copy of the book. It was an invisible thing. Uh, so, uh, and I found it very interesting. And I'm glad because I lent it to somebody. You know how that goes, you know. I'm glad to have a good summary of what was in the book here on, on one sheet of paper. It helps. Um, naturally, the tips ought to be eliminated. Um, it's a ridiculous thing to have a, a slush fund like that. Uh, it's so much worse than the slush fund Nixon had for Watergate. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And yet, um, when Emmanuel came in, he just took it off from daily like a freaking baton at the Olympics that we didn't have. And I'm glad we didn't. Uh, that was another thing. I think we owe you a lot, right? Because we didn't have that crazy Olympics. Which You're welcome. Yeah, you're, thank you very much, sir. Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, schools being closed, all that's terrible. Uh, I really think that this, uh, this trial was going to be a real um, um, red, um, red flag for uh, Emmanuel. We don't know why he's not running again, but uh, I, wish, uh, I wish Tom would run. I think I think that would be great, but um, um, I'll have to look into this Mara um, Enya. Uh, Mara Enya. Um, there's a number of several progressive candidates, but I can't run off their names uh, um, right now. But um, let's hope we have a good um, smattering of them, and um, we can make some improvements. The uh, uh, the corruption is terrible. Um, we didn't get into the fact that um, these construction projects of every type, they just take a lot longer than they should. They're just obviously wasting our time. I mean, there's been one at uh, 95th and Dan Ryan. Now, I don't know who exactly is responsible for that, but uh, that's been going on two years, and they've hardly done anything at all. And you drive past there um, every day. 
and virtually no work being done. And um, Lakeshore Drive, they just blocked off two lanes. Uh, <laughs> Finished October 3rd. I, I, I drove past there like a week apart. There wasn't any work being done. They just blocked off the two lanes, and I guess they're just, they just don't care. Um, so it's not only just that we're being ripped off huge amounts of money. Uh, I saw one article, I don't remember exactly where it was, that uh, there was a typical library that was being replaced uh, in Albany Park. And it cost, it was about the same square footage as a similar project in Denver. We just talked about Denver's getting money because Colorado had the sense to legalize marijuana. Uh, it was five times as much to build a similar library in Chicago. That money is just being stolen. Um, so without belaboring that, um, I would just like to mention that the uh, speed cameras, the red light cameras, uh, they are uh, diminishing one kind of accident, but of course the accident where people run into you from behind, that, that's increased. So, and nobody's really been able to be clear about the trade-off there. Uh, the speed cameras, if you are paying attention to your speedometer and you're looking very closely at it to make sure you don't go above the speed limit, you can't be looking for kids. So it defeats the whole purpose. It's an absolutely the stupidest thing that you could do if you want safety. You but you should, you should have something intelligent, okay? All right, I'm going next, if you don't mind. Let me do it. Okay, go ahead. How much money is I have a couple of quick observations. Everybody's been talking about the red light cameras. That's a misnomer. These things are not red light cameras. They are rolling tire cameras. If you roll over the line where you're supposed to stop, if the camera sees you roll over the line without making a stop, it clicks away and tickets. My, and also, the overwhelming majority of these cameras in our dedicated right turn lanes where you normally sweep around the corner without stopping. They aren't in unsafe uh, cross streets where there's a lot of uh, accidents where more people are normally paying attention. They put these cameras in places where people are driving safe and they don't have to pay attention to going two miles an hour, three miles an hour. My favorite camera, if you've never seen it, is at uh, the, the off-ramp, off of Rand Road, there's a dedicated right-hand lane that goes into the entrance of Costco. There's no cross street there. There's a red light camera there. As people roll around that going into the shopping center, they should have a big billboard that says, if you've got enough money to shop at Costco, give us 100 for the village. That's all that camera's there is for, is to take money off of people that are uh, unsuspecting, safe driving, there's never any accidents there, and the little brother to that camera is across the street at the entrance to the movie theater. There's no cross street there either, there's just an entrance to go into the movie theater, and they're taking money off of people that are just trying to get an evening of entertainment. Those cameras are revenue enhancement, nothing else. They're not owned by the city, they're privately owned. The other thing, everybody is talking about Chicago being broke. Well, like he said, Chicago's not broke. There's a whole lot of money, and there's some rich people that know where that money is because they hit it. I would, I would hold a, 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 a black tie and tail gala ball and invite the hundreds richest people into a nice big uh, ballroom, uh, you know, area in Chicago have a nice dinner and everything else for the hundred richest people in the Chicago area. Then at about 10 o'clock that night, lock the doors and say, here's the deal. We got to raise $5 billion and we're going to raise it before we unlock the doors. You guys can divide it up any way amongst yourselves, but some of you got it in pocket change collectively. So we're going to take pledges and if, if you f uh, fail to fulfill your pledge, you don't know what's going to happen next will go into your bank account. We got hackers. So uh, it's time we started taking back. We're, we're, get, we're approaching the point of the French Revolution where the French people said, you're not going to jail, you're going to the guillotine. 
They just started cutting heads off when they reached the point where these billionaire predators were responsible for disease, death, and destruction among the general population. I hope we can do something intelligent before we get to that point. But a lot of people around the country are going to think in those terms. We're close. So I'm going to start with Donald Trump. Trump. It's a mystery to me why Donald Trump is still there. I still think that the ultimate solution to Chicago's woes and the development of the West Side, particularly that of Cicero Avenue, is an old idea that has, needs to be revitalized. And that is the Crosstown Expressway. That will bring revenue and business to the near west side of the city, relieve congestion on the, uh, relieve some of the congestion that goes through the city, and generally make Chicago have a little bit more breathing room. As far as people leaving Chicago, there's a vast area of suburban out there that are welcoming these guys with open arms, Carpentersville, Hinsdale, Edison, uh, and a lot of other places that they will be welcomed in with open arms. If you don't like the city and want to get out, get out to the burbs. There's jobs, there's cheaper housing, and there's a lot of other stuff that you can do out there. And plus, in a lot of ways, the money's a little bit better for the public schools. So, you know, if you don't like the city and are upset with the corruption, come on out to where the money is. And that's the suburbs. Thank you. You know, the lady who got up after me about uh, what happened in Chicago Public Schools was... Uh, what? Keep it down, you guys. The lady who got up after me, who was talking about the Chicago Public Schools right, and what happened right. with the, uh, their budget. Uh, yes, she was right. I was talking about a suburban district that had complete control over, over its... It, it was just a, a district, a small district. She was talking about a school board in the larger district that did not have control over its tax levy. And yes, that's, that's the way it turned out. All right. Okay, let's give our speaker a big hand for tonight and we'll invite you back to the podium for the rebuttal. The well, last hey, word, Tom. You, you get the last word, whatever your last word is. Andy, Come on up there. my last That's word. Fine. Well, thank you again for inviting me. This is always a stimulating evening, as I say. Over the last, uh, oh, I don't know, four years, I've been in 150 public meetings. Uh, but you guys are great. You're always sharp. You got a lot of things to say. So I really applaud you all for coming out and supporting the College of Complexes. Uh, intellectual conversation, debate, civics, uh, it's fantastic. We can't have enough of it. So that's my, that's my tip of the hat to you all for doing what you do, and to Charles and the other organizers and your volunteers. Give it up for your volunteers who make this experience possible, really. Um, so uh, finally, I would just say, you know, uh, buy the book, OK? Uh, it's an each one teach one situation. We have people yeah, yeah, buying yeah. books and doing book clubs. So if you if you want to have a conversation at your church, at your civic group, at your block club, at your school, if you're connected to a school, we'll come to you uh, and we'll do civic house calls. So thanks a lot. I'll be around uh, signing books. So All right. thanks again, okay. guys. We got one more. Go ahead and Ooh. sign. Let them let them know. Yeah, one more comment here. And also next week. The on-deck circle for rebuttals is over here. Don't sit back here in the audience until the time the rebuttal runs out and expect to come up here and have a rebuttal. We'll make an exception tonight, but we're normally right now over the rebuttal time. This is our last rebuttal here tonight. Let's give him a big hand. No, he's not. Heavy pressure, heavy pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see what they can say. Uh, and everybody buy a book too if you can. The parking fiasco, I mean, everybody's concerned about that. It's really a uh, trying time uh, for the drivers. What's the use of having a car if you cannot park it, right? And uh, nobody answered in here. What's that contract done? Was it in, se in secret? Just like Wrigley Field was demolished in the middle of the night in secret? Because I didn't hear anything about it before it went into a fire. He doesn't know about it. Um,
And how did he double his uh, pension? Was that done in secret too? Mm, probably. Uh, have I a little uh, overlooking corruption? Lately, you probably heard about uh, the cop, two cops sleeping in their squad car on the job. You think it's an isolated deal? No, it's every Would they get paid for it? It's every cop. Every single cop does it. Every single cop know. that's asleep. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well. Oh, well, now I know why we have so many unusual incidences of violations in Chicago. Yeah, they're all sleeping. Okay. Until they save your ass. Come on, stop heckling. Come on, Charlie. Sit down. Say something. The stop sign for you. You you were complaining about uh, lights and all that. Uh, sometimes uh, the stop signs are abused too, because uh, you can make a full stop, and and they say, well, it, it wasn't long enough, and you go to court, and they say, how many seconds did you did you stay stopped? They don't tell you how many seconds is legal, or how many seconds should it be? They don't tell you. Yeah. So, three hundred dollars. Uh, how can eruption be? Uh, I love that if it can be eliminated, but at least minimized. How about limiting the political contributions? Will that help? No. Yes. No. Twenty seconds. Oh, five seconds. Twenty seconds. Twenty. Twenty. Okay. I like the politicians when uh, they are campaigning, and uh, be it federal or local, and uh, instead of talking about the issues, they bring their family and a, and a string of kids. I want to know about the issues. I don't want to know how sexually active they are. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Okay. All right. Okay, that's it for tonight. Let's Thank go. you all for coming, and uh, we will see you next week. Hey, where's your next all right. Thing? You mentioned something about this. You get a variety of comments.